Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Institute of Health and Social Care Management's Workforce Wellbeing Special Interest Group. This is always a very well supported special interest group, and uh, we're delighted today to be focusing on a topic that perhaps doesn't get discussed a great deal for perfectly understandable reasons. Our aim today is to rather bring it out into the open, get it talked about in, uh, from all sorts of different perspectives. We are focusing on domestic violence, and we have a wonderful panel. We've got Janaba Jum, who's CEO of the Queen Holistic Initiative. You can wave Janaba now if you like. I'm here. Enthusiastically. <laughs> there we go. We've got Geraldine Stanley. Uh, I think she's here. Yeah, founder and CEO of Rivers LPC. Give a wave, Geraldine. We have the fabulous, the one, the only, Wamba Bennett, who's Senior Contracts Manager and Freedom to Speak Up Guardian at Dudley Integrated Health and Care NHS Trust. Peter Gass is Strategic and Transformation Lead for Mental Health at Dudley Integrated Health and Care NHS Trust as well. And we've just lost for a moment Mark Brooks, OBE, who is Chair of the Mankind Initiative, but we expect Mark to join us very shortly indeed. Okay. Well, look, I, I just, I don't know how you want to play this, you guys, whether you'd just like to kind of discuss some themes that are you think are important for us to discuss or whether you'd like me to lead the conversation what do you think would you like to would you just like to go on the themes you would like to discuss you can lead john you can lead or would you one. like me to lead us along here okay well first of all i think it might be interesting uh, for people who are watching this just to get your individual uh, perspectives in terms of perhaps why you're interested in talking about this topic why you you've joined our panel today what your own um, experiences might be and um, and quite why you think this is something that we need to be discussing in a lot more detail when we're focusing on workforce well-being. So who would like to go first? Um, Moamba is always the kind of go first kind of a person. So why don't we honour that? Moamba, would you like to go first, I wonder? OK, um, yeah. So, um... Yeah, I'm Wamba Bennett and um, I work for Dudley Integrated Health and Care Trust, as John introduced, and I have three roles in, that, in the organisation, Senior Contracts Manager, Freedom to Speak of Guardian, and one of the staff side reps. So the reason I was interested in this is um, domestic violence is one of those things where it's ha if it's happening to somebody, you may notice something, then you think, well, what do I do? Or as, you know, my capacity as a guardian, I thought, you know, my role is there for people to speak up on issues that hamper their ability to, put, you know, to do their job. Um, and that could range from a, you know, a safety concern, you know, um, some, you know, inappropriate behavior, etc. But if it's an outside of work um, experience that is affecting their ability to do their job, then, you know, that's something that they may raise as an issue. And what would I do? So personally, um, I, I did, you know, sort of think about what has been my experience around domestic violence. And I was born in Zambia, lived there till I was 16. Um, and I do remember my aunt and uncle had a very um, challenging relationship, let's just say. And then, so this is my mom's sister. And then her daughter got married and her, her relationship was equally quite um, challenging. And there was violence in that relationship. And as a child, the way that our culture deals with that um, is quite a, a difficult one because it's quite closed. I was raised to say that, you know, you don't let people know what's going on inside of your home. So for the most part, my cousin went to work. She looked, you know, and looked successful at it, but at home, her life was very different. That's really hard to comprehend as, you know, she was only two years older than me. And I thought, well, what would happen if I was in that position? So. I think you know it was uh, dealt with, but again, it happened to be over there by a group of people in secret. And then, you know, I didn't see um, her husband any any uh, at any other time. So I think it's how you then address the cultural issues that will affect how that person's experience, as well as you know. We, um, we will come on to that one, yeah. but I promise. Uh, so I just want to go around from the panel's perspective and just get a little bit of background. That's it. Yes. <laughs> understanding uh, first up. Uh, what about Geraldine? Would you like to go next, Geraldine? So, yes, um, my interest is because um, 
have been involved in different discussions, but however, bringing it into the workplace, a lot of us spend more time at work than at home. And during the pandemic, I mean, things shifted because people would like work from home. But what wasn't defined is what home is for lots of people. For lots of people, home wasn't and still isn't the safest place to be working. So when it comes to domestic violence as well, I just thought that we need as a whole to look at different things, not culturally to help somebody when something goes wrong, but to help somebody when things are going right as well. And as you know, you've just heard that from different cultures is different. I mean, violence is violence, no matter how you describe it. However, it's recognizing what is violence. And my heart is just saying like with the workplace, let's bring everything together, join home and work, and if we can social together. So people don't want to be dif treated differently. We just want to be safe. Okay, thank you, Geraldine. Uh, we, I'd better go to Mark next, seeing as he, he comes, keeps flitting in and out, you know. <laughs> He's a bit like the shopkeeper in Mr. Ben, for those of you old enough to remember that. Uh, Mark, why don't you give us your perspective? Just a bit of background here about your own experience, why you're interested in this as a topic. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, John. And, and suddenly uh, my broadband literally disappeared. So, um, so I apologise to yourself and colleagues and everyone on the call. So, so um, I, I'm the chair of the Mankind Initiative charity and we focus on male victims and I've been involved in 50 for 15 years now. And I think, I think um, the key thing for me was looking at, like many colleagues, looking at different aspects of domestic abuse and different types of victims and survivors, perhaps um, some of those who had been overlooked in how we discuss and think about domestic abuse, but also in terms of making sure that um, there are more services for different groups and also that more of more people are able to come forward um, so that they're not forgotten. And that's really been my uh, thought process and involvement in this whole area, including um, including men from all backgrounds and faiths. Um, and I think that that's been an area which we really do need to look at more now. We will come on to the cultural stuff, I promise you, in a few minutes time. Thank you, Mark. Let's go to Peter, please. Peter. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I've, I've got a personal professional interest uh, in this subject. So um, I've only been with, with the NHS for about six, seven months. And prior to that, I was a, I was a police inspector and I was a detective as well. And uh, one of the leads on public protection and safeguarding and CID dealing with countless domestic violence incidents, situations, complex crime, uh, you know, murders, which were kind of, you know, interconnected and, and suicide as well, sadly. So um, from professional stance, that's, that's, that's a very... Um, a big topic to me, very close to my heart, and obviously what I've sort of you know dealt with for quite a long time, and up and down the country. Um, and in addition to that, as, as a manager or as a commanding officer, I dealt with quite a few internal domestic violence situations between uh, my staff or the, the people I was I was uh, responsible for. So I'd be, I'd be interested to see whether you know that this um, you know just just interested in, in people's experiences to see whether anyone's come across such situations. Uh, and just to discuss kind of best practice, perhaps, or things that we all should be considering. Perfect. Um, we are, and I think we are going to move on to that. We are going to move on to that in just a minute, Peter. I promise that will, in fact, that is going to be the first question once Janaba has just done her little quick intro. Janaba. Thank you. Hello, John. Thank you. Uh, I'm, just, I'm interested in this because, as uh, most of my colleagues said, um, domestic violence is just like um, is uh, next to home. And uh, most of my uh, colleagues from Africa didn't know or didn't um, realize or come to know what is domestic violence. Me being an illegal immigrant coming to this country and have that opportunity to know and understand what domestic violence is it. So I decided to form a charity uh, for the people back home and try to um, bring awareness and let them know what domestic violence is and then people who survive from domestic violence and their kids to support them. So this means everything for me because this is my life, this is what I do. Perfect, okay, well look, so as you can see everybody and as you've heard, we have a very broad spectrum of experiences and interest in this regard. Let's move straight into this. 
key question, I guess, to start with, and I don't mind who wants to pick up the baton first of all. What are some of the clues that we can look out for amongst colleagues to indicate there may be a domestic violence problem? In other words, how, how do we use our ears and eyes to gather evidence and to be on the watch for um, potential incidents like this? We'll then, I promise we will get into and what do we do about it? But first and foremost, how do we spot that it might even be happening? Don't mind who picks that up first of all. I don't mind going, John. John Go, yes, please. Yeah. Um, uh, if you say how we're gonna how we're gonna pick up, it's different from the which kind of people we're dealing with, because if we're dealing with the people from my culture, it's definitely hard to pick out like uh, to know that the past this person is going through domestic violence. It's completely different because we are so the way we are we are we are we are grown or we just personalize the, uh, domestic violence. We think that it's just something natural. It's part of the life. So it's hard for you to, if you know, identify that you are going through domestic violence. So for that person to be open to anyone and talk to you is really hard. But some of these things you can uh, look in for, it might be the person might be withdrawn, maybe be always be on, on herself, not trying to involve or join on whatsoever they are doing. Sometimes they might be like um, uh, unusual mark. If it's a uh, uh, physical domestic violence, you look for some um, marks because if they hit them or whatsoever, but they try to cover it, some of, most of them. Some of them will be always talking on their phone at work because they are speaking their own language, their tongue language, just for people not to know. Some of them will be emotionally, you will see them like, they, if they are a talkative person, they will become quiet. Or you just say a small thing to them and they just get snapped because it's what they come up from, from home. So it's not easy to identify, but there are little small things that uh, people who understand their culture and their religion can pick out that these people are going through. But it's not like, uh, like what, like me now, if I have a domestic violence, I can be open to anyone. I can tell people this is what's going on. But for a different culture, it's definitely not easy as everybody just be open up and tell people, or oh, you can see it on them because they try to hide it because it's a kind of shame on them. But what, what culture is teaching them is a kind of shame or kind of disgrace or you disgrace in the family or something like that. So they try to hide it as much as, as they can. So you have to be very vigilant and try to pick all those small little things, the marks, the getting upset very easily. They are normal person, cherry person who can laugh and display. But when it comes to that, you start seeing them withdrawing, start seeing them very emotionally all the time, or talking their own language, always busy going in and out. And all those things are sign of things that you can pick up from uh, domestic violence. Thank you very much. Good start. Um, Peter, your background in the in the police service must have given you a huge amount of um, experience in regards, you know, how do we spot stuff that may or may not be going on when you visit domestic uh, environments and you start looking and questioning as soon as you walk through the door. Can you shed any further light? So, uh, yeah, I fully agree with uh, Jane Abbott's comments. You know, that there's a physical element to it. So obviously we're looking for any sort of, you know, physical injury that a person might have in terms of bruising or and any other type of, you know, type of uh, situation. And I think the biggest challenge for me over the years was it's, it's not about you recognizing the signs and symptoms, but it's about a person who's actually going through it for them to recognize that they're actually being a, a victim of domestic violence. Because I think stereotypically we would suggest or we would look at physical aspects of domestic violence, but, you know, the, the whole situation has evolved so much and, you know, coercive behavior and the things that people can do to each other online and using technology, not even having physical contact, which is still considered domestic violence. And, um, uh, it's, 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 it's getting bigger and bigger. And I think it's the, the biggest challenge is, is for that person to actually recognize that, that, you know, they're going through something that perhaps they need support with. But, um, you know, mm -hmm. that's that's the biggest challenge. And one of the other challenges is, is to build a rapport, build a relationship with someone for them to actually open up and talk to you about, you know, the situation or the situations they're going through. Because like Jane Abba said, you know, it's, it's so the signs and symptoms of domestic violence are very similar to signs and symptoms of perhaps mental health condition or... Mm -hmm. Or, or trauma or someone who going through any sort of type of crisis they're very similar signs and symptoms so um uh, you know if you haven't got that relationship with someone and you can actually unpick it and, and listen to someone and it's all about active listening as well and perhaps using your experience you know it was it was quite simple and easy for me you know you know in a way because i've dealt with so many cases so as soon as you heard a story you could kind of compare it to the other stories mm -hmm. and you knew exactly what you were dealing with so you know, it was it was perhaps easier for me to do that. Um, but it, it is very challenging. It is very complex. Um, and it's, it's not just the physical aspects. And I think 
I think the spectrum of that, I would suggest, you know, if you were to look at statistical data, but perhaps the stuff that's going on online using technology, not actually seeing the person face to face is probably wider than the actual physical uh, attacks, physical right. abuse. So, so in other words, it's difficult and we need to have our antennae properly tuned and we've got to, you know, we have to discipline ourselves to look out for it. But I'm really interested in what you said, Peter, about a lot of people don't even realise that they are being domestically abused. Mwamba, abuse. um, might you like to comment on that, I wonder? So I think that um, the thing that we don't often talk about is what healthy relationships need to look like, regardless of your background or culture. What should you expect in a healthy relationship? And so when someone is experiencing unhealthy behaviors or or um you know an unhealthy relationship how do that does that person recognize wait this isn't healthy and a lot of it might be um you know in 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 my very limited experience around connection so when people talk about so how did you meet your other half and you know you get the stories and as you, you you kind of build that trust, you know, the way that they describe interactions in their relationship, you start thinking, hang on, that's not my experience. Why is that? And, and that then, you know, hopefully helps the other person to feel like I can, um, you know, out of a, a, a compassionate curiosity, ask a bit more and then get them to realize that perhaps what they're experiencing isn't what would be under a healthy relationship so i think there is and, we, and we've had a, to help with excuse me yeah to help with that we've had a number of pretty high profile cases recently that have mm. gone to court where people freely admit that they just didn't realize for a long period of time that they were being coerced and controlled and and abused basically and 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 you know finally when they do figure it out they have to take some pretty drastic and, and courageous action to uh, to take it to court and get the perpetrator yeah. properly dealt with. Uh, Geraldine, you've got your hand up. I was going to come to you next, actually, anyway, and, and then go to Mark. So you, you go ahead. Um, also, we need to realise that domestic abuse could be financial abuse, and that is difficult to recognise because you could be actually be in a job, but then your money is actually going somewhere else. Or maybe you're in a relationship, as you're saying, a couple of people have said, but then you have to pay out all the bills so that person, that colleague hasn't got enough money to spend. We might think they're in a high profile job, so therefore they should. So it might be little things like not having money for lunch or not having money for travel. And so in trying to recognize that you might not see the physical signs where you might see, you know, a change in habits. And you've just used the P word there, perpetrator. That is one word that I normally say is very, very scary from people from other cultures because they will tell you, hang on, that's my husband, that's my spouse. And they don't really want them labeled. So, John, that's like a no, no word, you know. Yes, and they will tell you, well, it's not that bad. Well, he's a nice man, but. But once you start labeling, giving them those terms, then you put whoever is going to complain the wood with war. So. All right, thank you, Geraldine. Um, I'm going to come to Mark now. Mark, look, you you, you represent or you, you stand up for men who've been experiencing domestic violence. I'm struck by the story of Ruth, Ruth Dodsworth recently, the ITV uh, uh, weather uh, reader who lives coincidentally quite close to me. And Ruth went through a horrendously coercive situation with her um, husband. Um, but she had to be a incredibly brave to to you know finally realize that she was being manipulated and abused it must be very challenging for men in what is unfortunately still perceived as a macho uh, environment to actually say you know what I, I i'm being abused i'm being coerced i'm being manipulated my partner is 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 hurting me you know this is this requires bravery to step forward or even acknowledge, I guess. It, it, I'd love your perspective in that regard. You're on mute currently, Mark. Yeah, absolutely, John. And I think, I think there's two perspectives to that in that for men themselves, the way they're brought up 
and you know others argue it's also part of their dna it's probably a mixture <laughs> so that they've society kind of um has a view about how men should feel and react and think and do and that impacts on men themselves because they feel this real sense of shame embarrassment uh, that they're less of a man that can also be exacerbated by size difference if they've got a female partner you know six foot two three guy uh five foot six woman um and that that can really um be an issue as well and and what I also fear is that they fear being laughed at and not being taken seriously um when they do tell someone that they will be told to man up or what sort of man are you um what did you do to deserve it which still happens so men fear that and then on the flip side there is about what society thinks of men and you know society um in, in in general doesn't always recognize men as potential victims of domestic abuse um and again there's sometimes a lack of professional curiosity from public services and also from friends and family that you know they haven't seen seen their brother or son for for ages or um, a, work, a work colleague is feeling really um depressed and anxious as colleagues have said but people don't necessarily think well could that be domestic abuse at home so you know sometimes it's not joined up in that way and you know sometimes our lack of spidey sense is not quite there for for men the big issue just coming back to the start of the conversation we found in working with women's groups as well when it comes to work is a change in workplace behavior so somebody who's conscientious at work is now their work's late or not as good as it used to be. They're sometimes turning up right on the dot, leaving right on the dot, always checking the phone. Also their clothes, so not just hiding bruises, but do they come in looking scruffy? Do they come in um, looking dishevelled? So the key aspect often is that there's a change um, and that change is normally gradual. But um, th that's a key indicator, especially with, with workplaces, with regard to is something awry at home? All right. So uh, five really interesting perspectives. <clears throat> How do we make it easy for these people? If you've spotted stuff or if you know they may be showing signs, as Marcus said, for example, how do how do we start a conversation with them to just tease out come on what's the problem you know and you're going to be fobbed off you know you you often you the first thing you're going to be you're going to be fobbed off. oh it's fine i'm okay it's i'm just going through a phase or whatever how do we how do we create an environment where that person feels they can actually start to divulge to us what's taking place and wamba you have your hand up so let's go to you first thank you so i think this is something um that we, why having the role of freedom speaker guardian so speaking up in itself how do you enable people to to feel safe to do that um i think if you notice something in my experience it's just asking very um tentative question and being very respectful so hi i've noticed that you know you're not quite you know your usual chipper self how are you um, and, you know, giving that person the space to say, do you know what, you, you know, if this is not the right time to talk about it, by all means, just, you know, grab me when you are free and keep offering them that olive branch to say that, you know, you do have this space and keep checking in, not too, you know, frequently, but again, just reminding them that they do have a trusted safe space where they can um, speak up, but it does take time, it takes trust. So I think that building relationships where, you know, it, it sometimes does save them the, the, the pressure of having to speak up if someone notices, because that's really powerful is, you know, that I have noticed. So how do we, you know, just open up with, with that and let them tell you their story? OK, I'm going to go to Peter next. I think I'd be interested, to, given your background, Peter, how you encouraged people to to actually tell you what is going on. Is it is it as simple as that, or is it? I suspect there's a rather more complex and uh, 
and, and delicate approach, first of all? Um, before, before I go into it, just, just really quickly, just it was really, uh, interesting to speak, um, listen to Mark, and I think we are not to forget about the um, LGBTQ group as well. And, you know, over the years, I've dealt probably with more crimes, uh, sort of, you know, between same sex uh, relationships, sort of man on man, which I think is becoming a bit more prevalent nowadays, sadly. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah, I appreciate all of, all of the uh, comments made by Mark, but I think, you know, the situation between man on man brings a, a different dimension to the situation altogether as well sometimes. Um, in, in, ter in terms of the um, the conversation, um, to, to be fully transparent, I, you know, if, if I was to put it into a statistical data, eight out of 10 times, people just tell me to go away or told me to go away, don't want to talk. You know, everything's fine, I'm fine. You know, this is my partner, this is my husband, this is my boyfriend, this is my girlfriend's wife, uh, not interested. So I, I fully agree with Moan, but it's about getting the right time in the right environment. It's, and I think uh, Geraldine's mentioned as well, it's, it's uh, you know, avoiding using labels, mm -hmm. uh, just having an open discussion, having an open conversation, just, just, just talk about their life. Let them tell you a story. Let them talk to you about, you know, the day, day-to-day -day stuff. What do they do? How do they, how do they sort of operate? How do they behave? Um, you know, it, no one's... Well, sometimes, but not often, would someone sit down to with you and say, well, this person hits me and then, you know, this happens and that happens. They will just talk to you about a day openly. And then, you know, as you're actively listening, you would realise that there's something happening there that perhaps shouldn't be happening. There's something a bit off, a bit coercive, perhaps. You know, someone's been manipulated or abused. Um, obviously, if we're talking about the physical, you know, sadly, again, the physical domestic violence and sexual abuse uh, incidences, are uh, perhaps simply in a way to to talk about because the evidence is there in front of you, so you can relate to that. And you know, quite often that's a, that's a starting point. You know, when you ask someone about the bruising or you know the injury, quite often that person would well, in my experience, would 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 break down, uh, sort of you know, gain very emotional upset, and they would perhaps say something to you that you know they've been waiting to say to someone for some time. Um, the situations where you know, this becomes very difficult is when we're talking about, you know, different types of domestic uh, violence abuse, where people are not seeing each other physically. And um, again, someone's mentioned, you know, people working away from, from the workplaces. So, you know, it's all done virtually as well. So as a manager, that must be a, an impossible mission sometimes to have that type of conversation on Teams or Zoom. Yeah. You know, it's all about, I, 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 it's all about the that. physical personal contact, uh, is, you know, I would suggest. I, I think it's very challenging via... Uh, a virtual because you don't know who might be you know on one side of the screen you, you just simply don't know what the circumstances are uh Gerardine, would you like to comment further and i'll come to janaba and then we'll move on to and, and i'll come to mark then and then we'll move on to a third question so Gerardine first right. thank you. i know peter you know and your colleagues mean you know, <clears throat> most times people would rather not get the police involved or get formal you know organizations involved they would somehow like to handle it themselves, even though they cannot, but then discuss with people who look like themselves, who understand. A lot of people go to work, when they're going through something like that, they will go to work for respite, whether they believe it or not, because being in the workplace keeps them away from whatever is happening at home. And most times I would say to people is, giving that person a longer period to cooperate or to come to you. It's more like they're grieving, but they're grieving from within. And I think in Western culture, we're sort of like, yeah, you're going through DV, do one, two, three, step A, five, six, you know, refer to this, that it's done. It's been four weeks, get over it. We've offered you a help. We've offered you this, we've, offered, we've given you lots of leaflets. What more do you want? But then some people need to, you know, like internalize it first and then get to the point. So I think that's, I think that's a great point. If I may just pick up on that quickly, Geraldine, what, what you're advocating is if you're going to be a high performance leader, you have to demonstrate some curiosity as to the welfare of the people who you lead. Okay. And that's not fulfilled by simply giving them leaflets and such like, you know, you, you actually have to engage with them and be curious about their welfare and demonstrate that through sensitive questioning. Yes, and also understand the life, as you said, even as a leader, is understand the life and the living arrangement of that individual. 
because we're saying culture, but sometimes culture is used as an excuse for abuse. And at the same time, culture, I'm sorry to say, is used as an excuse for leaving people alone. I mean, we talk about health inequalities. They say, oh, it's culture, hard to reach, not engaging, not accessing. For me, I just see all of that as an excuse. Because if you do understand, somebody could be in the UK, you don't know how long they're here for, you don't know what the visa arrangement is, where their living accommodation is. The abuse could be coming from whoever has put them up for the last three years. But they're not going to come and tell you, you have your mortgage to pay, you have your rent. She or he is not going to tell you that I'm living with my in-laws in a room where I have to get out of the house by eight o'clock in the morning and don't go back by 6 p.m. They're not going to tell you that we have two children in Africa somewhere. We're trying to bring the children in so we have to save money because they think we will not understand, but then maybe sending them externally to another organization will help. And of yeah, course- so, so, so forgive me, so what I'm trying to drive at is, how do we have a conversation with people who we suspect may be in that kind of vulnerable situation? How do we start to have that conversation so that they may feel able to share information? You may not be the person who starts the conversation. It's just make them aware of where to go. So okay. you, your leader, your HR department, wouldn't even your doctor may not be the person. Maybe they don't want to start, as Jennifer was saying earlier. You will ask them sometimes, they just burst into tears because they want to perform, 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 tick all the box, get paid at the end of the month. So maybe just saying to them, or maybe saying to somebody like Jody or Jennifer or Rupe, do you want to have a word with, I don't know, have a word with Jane, quietly. Somebody, Just yeah. the formal, formality out of it and doing the informal. So what would normally take six weeks? Maybe that person has would take it maybe another eight weeks before they speak about it. Okay, I'm just <laughs> conscious of time. We cannot go on forever. Janaba, let's come to you and then I'll come to Mark. Thank you. You're on mute currently, Janaba, I'm afraid. Okay, I'm on mute. I'm kind of agree of what they said. I think all we need to support them is like, um, we need the time, time, we need time because it takes time. So, and then we need trust, let them trust you and then the right people to talk to them as well. Because if you're talking of diversity, you have different people in there, as I just said earlier, not everybody take domestic violence, the other person take it as well. So what we need to do, as Geraldine just said, you need to get to the right people who can talk to them. It might be friends, it might be family, it might be the elderly, uh, the regional elders in that area or the community or the advocate of, or, or the BME or something, if it's coming to black people and that uh, Asian people BME. But you need to go the right person because there are so many things you should avoid to do because there are things that when you're doing it, you think that you are helping, you're not helping, you're making it worse because that person will not open up. It will so never. Don't, so don't necessarily assume that you personally you assume, are going, that to, assume. Are going to be the Never service. assume. Never as or never it comes first from you to say that, yeah, you are going through this, I know. No, you don't know, because you don't know what their culture are, you don't know what religion and how they take domestic violence. So the right person, you should uh, involve the right person. This is the, uh, the, the, the thing, because- can I, just ask, now, can I just ask, how do we find, how do we, if I'm the manager of somebody and I suspect there's a problem, but I also, I'm smart enough to realize I'm, I, I can't handle this because it's outside of my experience. How do I find the right person to direct? Most of the workplace, John, now we have diversity. Most of the culture, we have mixed cultures. I think you will see somebody who is close to the person because most of people, they make friends at work or they, you need somebody they are too close to. You can use those people, but not actually you, the manager, going and saying the wrong thing or something that will make it worse. If for a, for a start, and then until you got that idea that this person is going through domestic violence, then you send them to the right place to go for help. But not to because there are some ways if you want to take it it seems like you are putting more fuel in the fire because you will make them to close up instead of opening up yeah i'm just sorry what i'm trying to do is figure out how how do we find the right person to send them to i mean look, i i'm i'm lucky i've never experienced personally domestic violence um, John, you need to be proactive the employers need to be proactive you don't wait until there is a problem and then say yeah well, but, I, but if i may that that's that's a lot easier said than done you know in the nhs there are big you know who are big employers and they've often got these 
fairly sophisticated and capable and well-resourced HR departments. In social care, they're often really small organisations and, and they may not have that kind of resource available. Yeah, they could be a small organization, but then they have somebody there to fix the taxes so they don't get fined by, by, <laughs> by inland revenue. So they can be proactive, have somebody there to deal with diversity and things like this before it happens. So they're small. So why don't we see all lots of um, organizations being dragged along for tax fraud? The tax evasion because they fix well, let's, it. Let's not go there. I, 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 no, I I'm get, just saying, I for example, the fix it. We're gonna, we don't so have we time to look at that. Be proactive. All right, Mwamba's got her hand up, and I'm going to come to Mark, please. I think um, uh, this is the same for any issue that you want to speak up is letting people know what the routes are, where they can go. So, does the organization make it clear to staff that if they have concerns or issues, these are the people to contact. So lots of organizations will have people that are trained as mental health first aiders, for example. So, you know, that's a group of people that someone, you know, may be able to approach and that will hopefully have a range of people who can provide that safe space. Um, and so it's make, letting you know that person know that if you know I may not be the person I've noticed a change I may not be the person that you wish to expansively talk to however here are a number of places that you could thank you yeah. thank you Mwamba that, that's that's forgive me that was what I was trying to get to so that, that's very helpful Mark I'm going to come to you next if I may and then we'll yeah, move on to the next question yeah brilliant I've, I think there's two points to add and one of them similar or uh, bridging on from what Amber said, but first of all, it's about culture. I mean, and when I mean culture, I mean culture within your organisation. So have you got a culture where people feel safe to disclose whether domestic abuse or any other issues to their managers, to HR, any safeguarding leads without fear of being judged badly within that organisation for those types of things. You get some organisations where it's very command and control, where if, if you disclose any weakness, then that will be counted against you. So it's important to have a, a very open staff culture, which will then allow any victim of this to talk to their managers without fear of any consequence on them in terms of their job. The second area is around um, Bill Mwamba is about making sure that there is signposting in organize in, in your organization to domestic abuse organizations that will help. There's lots of national helplines there's also local organizations funded by the council who are funded to help domestic abuse victims um and they will have specialist workers who will do that so as an can organization I just, can I just point out as, you, as you're yeah. just mentioning this yeah. peter's put up a really useful tool which is a uh, surviving domestic abuse leaflet yeah that, uh, from victim support that he's put up there sorry i didn't mean to cut you off mark that's that's okay so so that's really important so because a lot of domestic abuse victims will not want to tell a work colleague but they will want to try and contact another organization as you as an employer if you've provided that information on a leaflet or on an intranet or sharepoint um if the, your work colleagues contact any of those helplines and you don't know they've done it, you have still done your job. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, I totally agree Let, with you. Let's move along because I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of that we wanted to discuss cultural differences to understanding whether somebody is being abused or isn't being abused. Cultural differences in respect of uh, acknowledging that abuse is taking place versus, oh, it's just the normal thing we do here. I'm looking at the 2011 census, 13.4% of people in England and Wales were born outside the UK. Um, and we'd be idiotic to assume that every culture around the world is the same as ours in terms of its laws and customs and approach to domestic violence. Can, can, you, can any member of the panel give us some picture of how we, how we confront that, where people who, who are now living here believe that what's being done to them is still okay? How do we, 
how do we overcome that and help them to understand that there are differences here that they need to be aware of? Peter, you've got your hand up, so we'll come to you first, then I'll go to Geraldine. Thank you. Yeah, just a uh, quick point, just not to drag up my uh, response. I, I think culture, I think someone said, some, sometimes it's quite often used as a... Um, as a pivot, as, as something to cover something up and refer to culture and say, well, this person's from this continent, this country. So they, they probably, that's the way they be treated. That's the way, that's what they know. That's what they're used to. And um, I, I think quite a, quite a, quite a simple answer to that. As long, you know, as soon as you arrive in the UK, with whatever capacity you are, you know, automatically in, immediately um, adopting British laws and you're protected, you're protected by those laws and you are asked or even demanded to abide by those laws. So regardless of where you're from or where you've come from or where, you, where you're traveling to, you know, as soon as you land in this country, that's that's the law that you should be obeying and that's the, the law that's going to protect you. And I think thank, thank you, that's probably the bottom great, line. It's a, it's a great point to make. I'm, and one of the reasons I'm keen to bring this up is the amount of overseas recruitment that we're trying to engineer at the moment on top of what we've already done. You know, this needs to be a part of the induction program that we give to people who've, who've come and joined us from... Uh, overseas areas. Uh, Geraldine, I promise to come to you next. You're up. Um, with domestic abuse, what we need to understand as well is that for some cultures and some countries, whatever is going on is assumed as okay. And some people only know the difference when it is actually identified to them when they get, for example, into the United Kingdom. And then once that is recognized, and then we need to actually slowly you know address this point so, so sorry the, so the key is how do we help them to understand that it's different here is the, is the same thing like what well, just do as we've been doing as we normally do and actually raising the awareness and let them know and having the you know the opportunity there what i'm saying is when people come to the uk and for example now we're talking about domestic violence there are women, for example, I work with lots of women who will say, I did not know this was domestic violence until I came to England. So there are two things to that. One, them understanding what it is, what we're talking about. And two, before we try to fix it, if not, we're trying to fix something that they don't even know. No. And then we're in a situation where we have identified, we as in England, or you, so we identified a problem and then we give them a solution. In other words, we have a solution waiting for a problem to happen. And then that's what things normally follow. Well, but may, maybe that's part of it. Um, thank you, Geraldine. Wamba, you've got your hand up. Yes. So I think when we talk about culture, there's, you know, um, tribal custom and practice, there's religion. It's, it's, a, it's quite a, a complex thing when, when you mean culture. But to that person, it's understanding from, from them through that dialogue and trusted conversation, what they understand healthy relationships need to look and feel like and understanding you know what is acceptable in the in the country that they're in but very much from a I'm coming alongside not I'm here to save you because that sometimes can also put people off when they feel like this is someone telling them rather than asking in a coaching way so they come to that realization of what a healthy relationship should have and what it shouldn't and also there is some support that they would need because it's changing potentially their entire frame of reference. So the labeling, you know, matters. So not, you know, your perpetrator or your abuser. It's talking more about, you know, your husband may not be treating you in a healthy way, but getting them to express that by just pointing out, this is what a healthy relationship looks like between two people who are, you know, who love and respect each other. So not necessarily, you know, it's, it's how you, you br it's basically gently talking to them to that point of realization of, wow, this isn't acceptable. So it strikes me, one of the, one of the things here is, you know, if we, it, it's not, this doesn't necessarily have to start with a one-to-one -one conversation, does it? And part of what we can do, presumably, is to, is to maybe run events like this and workshops exactly. yeah. and, 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 and yeah. things in the workplace so that people can find out about what the laws of the land are and yeah. what's acceptable here versus not acceptable here. Mm -hmm. um, so I like that. OK, Janaba, yeah, you've got your hand up. 
Yeah, John, I just agree with the last point you just said. It's not been uh, like talking to one person, one to one, because we need to understand that these people come into this country and they've been grow up, they have their nature, they have their nurture, and they believe that domestic violence is part of normal life for them. So the moment they enter in here, they don't even know the law of UK. They don't even know what is domestic violence. So the only awareness you can, I can say is only give them awareness, much awareness, let them know, as my colleague said, let them know that this is appropriate, this is not appropriate. This is what a relationship, good relationship would look like. Because people like me, when I was coming to the UK, I married before coming to the UK. I didn't know what was domestic violence. My family were going domestic violence through domestic violence. I didn't even recognize, I didn't even know. But going through these seminars and sitting down with people, having all these things going, learning, with different and that makes me know, oh, now this is domestic violence and I'm gonna stand against that. But without you knowing what is domestic violence and what this country is doing towards domestic violence, you can stop it. This is the only thing, awareness. It's awareness all the time, okay. try to bring it up as normal, like if somebody is having uh, depression or something, the things we do for awareness, that's the same thing we should take domestic violence, the root of domestic violence. Okay, thank you. Um, Mark, I'm going to come to you. I'd like you to comment on what we've just been discussing around culture, but I'd also like to look at, at the specifics of financial domestic abuse. I think that's uh, something that is, is, is not habitually talked about. And I'm, I'm just kind of warning the rest of the panel, I'm going to start asking you about financial uh, domestic abuse in a moment or two. But Mark, first of all, for you, please. Yeah, just just on just on that on that issue around culture, I think one of the key things is actually describing what abuse is. So not just using the word domestic abuse or et cetera, but actually giving real examples, not only case studies, but describing, you know, psychological abuses, um, are you a victim of psychological abuse, which is being humiliated, being belittled? Are you isolated from your friends, family? Are you um, you've, are you um, being assaulted and hurt by your partner? So actually saying those words, the, the actual examples, and going on to financial abuse, you know, a good example is, you know, are you being denied any access to money? Um, are you being controlled by what you can eat or how what jobs you can do, whether you're allowed to um, study? Um, also, are, are you being denied money to, to be able to do um, anything, including the fact that you might be bringing money into the household yeah, to have is, access is, to is your money, bank account? Is money being taken so, off you without your consent, that, for example? A, absolutely. And But the thing is, it's describing that rather than just saying, are you a victim of economic abuse? Brilliant. You yeah. have to explain okay. the detail. So that's how I would segue into that, John. That's, that's, uh, I'm so glad you did that. You did far better than I could have done, that's for sure. Would anybody else, Janaba, would you like to comment on the financial abuse element? You know, and I'm again, I'm thinking, particularly for overseas people, you know, that they, they may be thinking, right, part of my duty here is to send a heap of money back to people uh, back home where... I actually don't, I, I don't really want to do that, but I'm I kind of now being controlled to do that. So that, yeah, it does happen, John, because that's what we know that you have the responsibility of taking care of those people. Oh, even if it's a husband, wife, you have to help me to build my own, your own, their own house instead of you. Because uh, in Africa, most of people, they say the men owe the home, you go and marry there, but at the end, even when you divorce, you got nothing out of that house. And that house been building, it's built with your money because you are here. Where they're helping with the bills or the house rent in here, you are contributing to that house built in Africa because without your money in this house, that house in Africa not, cannot be built. But at the end, when you separate it, the house is the man's house because he is the one you've been sending money or you've been helping paying in this in this house in here. But where is it now? Is he's been planning his life in future in the, in Africa, and then you've been paying the rent and looking after this or do whatsoever with your money here. Yeah, I'm just so, trying to figure out what we do about it. I mean, I, I get the I get the mechanics of it. I'm saying right. So how how do we help somebody who may not even be aware? that a crime is being perpetrated there. Awareness, we go back to awareness, John. Everything is aware. People don't even know what final, uh, financial abuse is. They don't even know. They think that my husband bring me here and my money belongs to him. If I walk, and some of them will threaten you with that. I bring you here. 
if you stop contributing, I take you back home or you will not get your, your, your papers because some of us are dependents when they came over this country. So they will tell you, it's because of me, you are here. So your money belongs to me, you give it back to them. And most of them, even in the, when they're paying them, they pay them in their husband's account. They don't even have their own accounts. So yeah. these are the little things that you would look into and then know that their finance have been abused, been abused. but they didn't even know. So the main thing for me is awareness. Awareness, the awareness okay. out there. Thank you. And Peter, you had your hand up. I'm, I, I suspect you're going to say something very insightful at this point. Just a quick point, because again, we can talk about financial abuse for quite a long time. I think the, the, the main point for me, I've never actually come across financial abuse on its own. It's, 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 it's always an, an add on to something else. So, um, you know, there would be always an element of physical abuse, sexual abuse and another type of abuse. So um, with financial abuse, uh, it is very difficult to, to again, to, to identify quite difficult to do anything about it once you're in that sort of you know cycle uh, but quite often it's attached to other things um, you. so you're going to say something massively insightful you see I've, I've worked you out already you only you only open your mouth when you've got something really cool to say so thank you for that um wamba yes i think it's also important again like i said before around how you help the person to realize what is healthy and what isn't it is it is perfectly healthy to help someone but it's how you're doing that. Is it at the cost of your own well-being? So as much as, you know, and, and whatever the context, it's that oxygen on a plane mask thing. So when the oxygen mask come down, do you put everybody else's mask on and then you, or do you put the oxygen mask on and then you can help everyone else? So while you're living in the UK, you do understand that you've got obligations. So are you able to pay your rent to, you know, as well as, you know, help and, and having that conversation that, that helps them to realize, you know, I, you know, I do need to do these things and I can help, but perhaps not to the I'm level of expectation. Across you. We, we are go, we're getting bang short of time. It's all my fault. <laughs> Don't worry. Geraldine, you've got your hand up. Quick point, please. Me? Yep. Oh, <laughs> um, I just wanted to say we should also remember that when we say culture, it doesn't mean somebody who's just come into the UK. It could be people who are already living here. And secondly, financial abuse doesn't always mean that that person's money has been taken away. It could be that the other person, people involved, are not, um, are not honoring their own financial obligation and all the, you know, the burden is left on this person. And also we're talking about different cultures. Um, yeah, just real quick, please, because I do want to uh, give the audience yeah, time. We're talking about you, if, um, um, domestic abuse or domestic. I just want us to stress over and over and over again. It could be other members of the family, family friends, etc. Thank when you. It's the culture. Thank you. Okay. Well, look, that's been fascinating. We've got about seven minutes left. It would be inappropriate of me not <laughs> to give our audience the opportunity to ask the panel a question. Um, can I just say, if, if, if anybody would like to uh, raise an issue they've heard about today confidentially, we are very happy, uh, Jade and I, to, to take uh, a, a question from you and we would pass it on to the appropriate authorities. And, and you know, if you just want a safe, confidential, not workplace based route, uh, then Jade and I will be happy to to help you. OK, I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, but would any member of the audience like to ask our panel a question, I wonder? I really hope somebody will, because I've just I've just kind of, you know, cut them all off in their prime so that we can have time for questions. I always find if you make if you go silent, then somebody will eventually crack and say something. <laughs> no. All right. Look, I'm going to I'm not going to try to push water uphill. Well, OK, in that case, you got 30 seconds each. I'm going to start with Janaba, then go Peter, Gerardine, Mark and Wamba in that order. 30 seconds. What advice would you give anybody in the audience today who's a manager, a leader of people? What would you give them in terms of 30 seconds of advice around domestic violence awareness? Janaba first. All I would say is like, just treat domestic violence as any other mental health and give awareness and give a space for people to be open so that they can come and like talk to you. Treat it as if somebody has depression or whatsoever 
and then let's allow people to come and talk to you, be open to them, and then give the game that space and then give them that time and patience they need. Thank you, Janab. And that was pretty much bang on the 30 seconds mark as well, I think. Peter, over to you. The only advice I would give to any manager or leader, listen, listen, listen. You know, just follow uh, Mr. Blair's education, education, education. Listen to your staff, actively listen and do something about it. You know, listen to them, build that trust and, and do something about it. That's the only advice I would give. Perfect. And just to reiterate, Peter has put a victim support document up. And Moamba has now put up a domestic abuse how to get help uh, document as well, which I think is very helpful. So thank you to both of you. Uh, Geraldine, yes. You're on mute currently, forgive me. I hate having to tell people that. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, you know. I would say domestic violence, mental health is as important for any employer as paying your taxes. Oh, that was short and sweet. There we are. Okay, we'll take that. Thank you, Mark. Over to you. Um, my my only my only thing to add is remember anyone can be a victim of domestic abuse, relevant of their gender, sex, sexuality, and ethnic background. So make sure that you have a clear mind and recognise that, um, and then that will be a, a great step. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Mwamba. So um, Mark stole my line. Um, <laughs> I think it's <laughs> the face of a domestic violence isn't what I grew up thinking or what my own bias is. Be open, be curious and be compassionate. I like that. I think open, curious, compassionate. I think we can do a lot of good if we all abide by that. Uh, and just a final thing, if I may, you know, um, I do happen to know Ruth, uh, the ITV weather lady who uh, under, underwent horrendous coercive control and I can tell you you know I, I do know reasonably well I had no idea no idea for years and yet you know I'd meet her in the supermarket and have a chat with her I'd meet her on the high street and have a chat with her and all the time I was doing that just blithely unaware she was being tragically coer uh, coerced by her partner who's uh, you know uh, served time for it so it's not easy to spot it, yeah. you know. I think so long as we are curious and open and compassionate, then we have a chance. There we are. All right. Well, I think that's been fascinating. I'm hugely grateful uh, to all of you on the panel. Janaba, Peter, Geraldine, Mark and Mwamba. You've, you've, you've served our members perfectly well this afternoon. Thank you very much with your advice and insight and guidance. Uh, I think we might do, we might kind of hoover up a load of the resources around this and actually present them as a bit of a resource for our IHSCM members. Let's see where that might take us. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Workforce Wellbeing uh, Special Interest Group meeting, which I'm guessing, Jade, is probably January now, is it? Or have we got one in December? We've got a combined meeting with our Mental Health Special Interest Group uh, next week on the 25th of November. And we are having a session on how to effectively lead wellbeing within your organisation. Perfect. And um, I've, 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 I've got to do this, OK? I've just got to do it. But if anybody's really interested in a male voice, a Welsh male voice choir, singing a song called The Impossible Dream, <laughs> and all linked to mental health charities, then you need to Google Cowbridge Male Voice Choir now and uh -huh. click on the link and you'll find it. And you may recognise somebody singing along as well. Okay. Right, I have to do that. Shameless plugging for it. But there we go. Okay. All right, Tula Mond, have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thank you everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.